Good morning. Thank you for joining us today at Mount Pisgah. Today, we're in part two of what we started last week in this series on Jesus, Moses, and the last days. And we're looking at the new covenant, God's chosen man, who is the Messiah. We're going to see exactly what the Torah, the prophets, and the writings had to say about his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension, and his return. Remember, Jesus said the Torah and the prophets and the writings all spoke of him. If you're ever in the Mount Pisgah area, we invite you to join us. We meet at 1288 Mount Pisgah Church Road in Apex, North Carolina, 10 a.m. on Sunday morning. And as always, don't forget, if you have any prayer needs, please feel free to put them down in the comment section below. May the joy of our Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lord Jesus Christ, be yours today. Let's go to, let's start out this morning in Isaiah, and we want to begin, not in Isaiah 42 this morning, we want to jump over and let's start in Isaiah 53. reason why we're going to do this this morning is last week we were talking about God's chosen man, God's perfect man, Jesus being God's elect one. He is the one who has brought about and established the new covenant, the Son of God, we saw how God had become man, 100% man, how he laid aside his rights and privileges as God in order to take on human flesh and was willing to become a bondservant, set an example for us in the truest sense of the word, laying his life down. And the prophet tells us that God exalted him. Paul tells us that God exalted him as well and gave him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that he is Lord. We've also seen how that, as we've talked about over the last several weeks, that the Torah, those first five books of the Bible, everything, especially in the aspect of the law itself and the sacrifices and all the aspects of the, the Sabbath and the pr priesthood, the sacrifices, the celebratory feasts that were God's feasts, they all were pointing to Jesus as the Messiah. When he talked about in Matthew 5 that I have not come to destroy the law and the prophets, but I have come to fulfill them, he is simply saying that I am the goal of the law. I am the goal of the prophets. I am the fulfillment. This is what they were all pointing to. And as we've seen over the weeks, that faith was always the only way to walk with God. As we find in Hebrews 11, without faith, it's impossible to please Him. We see this long list of characters in the Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, and how that they all walked by faith, and they trusted God. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness sake. He was declared righteous before God, made right before God because of faith. And it's always been by grace that people have had a relationship with God. The law as it came in, as we saw the other week, was Israel's constitution. Paul says, it says it was a tutor to guide us, to lead us to the Messiah, to point us to the Lord Jesus Christ. It showed the ways in which practically at that point, in that time, at that stage in history, Israel could fulfill God's command to love him and love one another, love their neighbor as herself, and gave them all the specific ways, spelled it out for them, how they were to do that. But again, as we look at all of this, Jesus made it very clear, especially after his resurrection. He said that everything that was written about him in the law, in the prophets, and in the writings, all were pointing to his work that he would do, and he is all through each of them. And one of the pertinent aspects of what the law and the prophets were pointing to had to do with his work of redemption. Now, the work of redemption is a whole lot more than just the cross itself. It's about his whole life. His whole life was the work of redemption, the incarnation, crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension, and his glorification. Each one is a vital piece of the puzzle. But in all of the writings in the Old Testament, what we consider to be the Old Testament, 
the predominant prophecies were specifically concerning his death, what he would do on the cross, and they were very specific. There was no doubt about when Isaiah wrote these things, when Hosea wrote some of the things that he did, when the prophet Daniel saw some of the things that he saw, they understood that this was coming at a point in time. They didn't know who it would be, as Peter tells us, but they knew that it had to do with the work of redemption and it had to do with the work of deliverance and salvation. They were all pointing to Jesus. Now, when we start out looking at this, we're going to start out looking at the cross. And we ask the question, you know, what was the cross really all about? It's interesting, again, as we talked about several weeks back, when you look at the law, and we saw in the first 11 chapters, at least, of Genesis, that there were prophecies spoken, there were pictures given, and there were also patterns that were followed. One of the things that you find as a pattern is you have Adam, who is created by God, he's placed in a garden, he sins, He's cursed, and the curse comes, and he has cast out. All of this is the consequence of his sin, and God has to remove him from the garden, and then, of course, sets the cherubim to guard the way into the garden and the tree of life. Jesus, as the last Adam, has that same pattern repeated. But now, instead of God driving man out of the garden... It is man cursing God and driving him out. Because you have the last Adam, Jesus. He goes into a garden wherein he submits himself totally to the will of the Father to drink the cup of suffering that is set before him in perfect obedience. Man then turns on God the Son, and He is cursed with their sin and is removed and cast outside of the city gates. He is put out. He is cast out by man. The reason being because of His love for us. Man cursed God. The pattern is reversed, but it turns out that man's cursing of God is the fulfillment of God's original promise to Adam and Eve, wherein the serpent would bruise his heel. There would be suffering that would be involved by the one who would come, but the one who would come would crush the serpent's head. What was the cross all about? Two pertinent passages. The first one we're looking at here is in Isaiah 53 that are very detailed about the cross. And I'm going to read it from a more Hebraic perspective in the Scripture in the Tree of Life translation just to give you some of the flavor of, of, of a Hebrew understanding of this. It's not a whole lot different from most translations. But in verse 1 of Isaiah 53, Who has believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord Adonai revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him or beauty that we should desire him. And this again, this is understood to be messianic. It's always been understood to be a messianic prophecy by the Jews. And why, you know, people say, look at the blindness that's set upon the mind of a Jewish person who cannot see this is pointing to Jesus very clearly. But as Paul says, they have a veil over their eyes. Whenever Moses and the prophets are read, they don't see it. But it's to us, it becomes, it's very clear. And the prophet is saying, here's a humble person who's coming, the servant of the Lord, and there's nothing unusual physically about him that says, hey, that's the Messiah. Wow, look at him. No, he said there's nothing. Nothing that would make us desire him. Nothing physically that would say, yeah, let's make him the Messiah and the King. Verse 3, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, one from whom people would hide their faces. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. 
Surely he's borne our griefs. He's carried our pains. Yet we esteemed him stricken, struck by God, and afflicted. Notice this is what, the, what Isaiah says. From the human perspective, our assumption was that what happened to him was being done to him by God. God was afflicting him. God was cursing him. God was the one who was doing all of these terrible things to him. That's what we perceive. But, then Isaiah says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed because of our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace, our shalom, our wholeness and well-being was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. So Adonai has laid on him the iniquity of his all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Because of oppression and judgment, he was taken away. As for his generation, who considered? For he was cut off from the land of the living. Why? For the transgression of my people. The stroke, literally a singular word there, the stroke was theirs. The stroke that he took upon himself was their stroke deserved by them. His grave was given with the wicked and by a rich man in his death. Remember Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man provided the tomb. Though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth, yet it pleased Adonai to bruise him, to cause her to allow him to suffer. And we know, and we'll see this in a minute, it was not God that did this. But from the perspective of humans, it was looking like that. But again, Peter and all of the apostles make it clear that Christ was crucified and had done what was done to him by the hands of of wicked men. It was preordained for the father, by the Father and the Son to permit men to do this to him. And he submitted to it. And he says that his soul was a guilt offering. He will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. And the will of Adonai will be succeeded, uh, succeed by his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous one, my servant, will make many righteous. He will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion with the great. He will divide the spoil with the mighty because he poured out his soul to death and was counted with transgressors, two thieves on either side, and counted as a transgressor and dealt with like that. He bore the sin of many and he interceded for the transgressors. Now, you and I reading that, that's pretty clear, isn't it? We say, wow, that's, that's very clear. The cross, that's, that's pointing to the suffering of Jesus, pointing to his burial, also pointing to his resurrection, for he will see his offspring. His days will be prolonged. Death will not have the final word. And all this written over 800 years before Christ ever set foot on this earth. Again, Jesus was saying to them, this is what the prophets were pointing to. My death, my resurrection, everything that's going to happen from here on out, everything that happened prior to this, my coming to this world, where I would be born, to how I would enter this world, my life, my ministry, everything that I would do, it's all been talked about. This passage is very clear to us. We also remember that on the cross, Jesus cried something that has caused a great deal of, uh, of consternation for many people throughout the centuries, especially in the last three or four hundred years, where he cries out to the Father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That comes from Psalm 22. So look over there if you would. And let, this, is, this is an interesting thing. <clears throat> remember that Back when the Scriptures were written originally, there were no chapters and verses. So the only way anybody had a reference point for what a person was talking about, and generally this would be because, again, most of the Jewish people who were, were religious, they had much of the Scripture memorized. And so 
in order for them to know where a person was speaking from, especially when it came to the Psalms, because the Psalms were the hymn book of the Jewish people, the singer or speaker would begin with the first several verses. Everybody would pick up immediately on what psalm it is, and then they would jump in and join, and they would carry through and say or sing the whole psalm. Now, we know that on the cross, Christ is crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it comes from Psalm 22. So any Jew sitting around, we don't know because John didn't record it. None of the gospel writers recorded it. Did Jesus continue on through that psalm as he was there on the cross? And the people around that were listening to it who were Jewish knew the whole psalm. And a lot of people have this concept that on the cross, God the Father turned His back on His Son and looked away from Him, which is complete falsehood. The psalm tells us that. But on that cross, Jesus was feeling what humans feel, a sense, this foreboding coming over Him of being left alone, as it were. No one was coming to rescue or help him. He felt that way. He could feel that feeling of despair trying to come upon him. But notice from the very first verses of this psalm what it says. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Distant from my salvation are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you didn't answer. By night, but there was no rest for me. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. Am I a worm and not a man? Am I a scorn of men despised by people? All who see me mock me. They curl their lips, shaking their head. Ah, rely on Adonai. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, since he delights in him. You see, here's the taunting. It took place at the cross by the the thieves as well as by the Romans and by the Pharisees. It taunted him with these words. Yet you brought me out of the womb, made me secure at my mother's breasts. From the womb was I cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. There's no one to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircled me. And again, this symbol, the symbolism of the bull has go, goes all the way back to Baal. And he's talking about the demonic powers now that have surrounded him, that are assaulting him there at the cross. They open wide their mouths against me like a tearing, roaring line. I am poured out like water. All my bones are disjointed. My heart is like wax melting within my innards. My strength is dried up like a clay pot. My tongue clings to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs have surrounded me. A hand of evildoers has closed in on me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare. They gape at me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. But you, Adonai, be not far off. O oh, my strength, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my only one from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild oxen. Rescue me. And then there is a shift. I will declare your name to my brothers. I will praise you amid the congregation. You who fear Adonai, praise him. All Jacob's descendants, glorify him. Revere him, all you seed of Israel. For he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the lowly one, nor has he hidden his face from him. The first verse seemed like that, didn't it? But the psalm goes on and says, no, 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 that's not reality. That did not happen. The father did not turn his back on his son. He did not hide his face from his son. But when he cried to him, he heard him. 
For you is my, from you is my praise in the great assembly. I will fulfill my vows before those who fear him. Let the poor eat and be satisfied. Let them who seek after him praise Adonai. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will bow down before you for the kingdom belongs to Adonai and he rules over the nation. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. Everyone who goes down to the dust will kneel before him, even the one who could not keep his own soul alive. His posterity will serve him telling the next generation about my Lord they will come and declare his righteousness to a people yet to be born because he has done it all of this is very clear to us on this side of the cross what was the cross all about well throughout history believers have tried to explain it in different ways. They've tried to come up with different theories or formula. Like, what happened there when Jesus was hanging on that cross? What was transpiring? What was Isaiah talking about? What was David writing about in Psalm 22? And again, David, even further back than Isaiah, a thousand years before all of this, is writing these words. Again, he didn't know who it applied to. He was under the inspiration and direction of the Holy Spirit. What, what was it all about? Well, early on, some of the early believers took on what we refer to as the moral influence theory. This is what was happening at the cross. And basically, that Jesus hanging there on a cross, he did that as an example for us. He was setting an example for us. Us, to bring a positive transform transformative change to humanity, to reform society, that he would inspire men, he would inspire women to follow his example, to live a life of love that would be empowered by the Holy Spirit and thereby transform and change the world. Many saw that that was what was happening on the cross. He was setting the example for us. Then another theory that was held by many of the early believers what was what was known as the ransom theory. And the whole idea about the ransom theory, and it kind of was held along the moral influence theory that Jesus was setting an example for us, that it deals with the actual death of Jesus and the effect that it had on all of humanity. Basically, it goes back to simply saying that Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they sold humanity into slavery. Slavery to sin, slavery to Satan, slavery to death. Man, humanity was given over to it. And that something had to be done in order to set people free. The word redeem in the New Testament, is taken from a term that was used in slave trading and that where someone could take the place of a slave and redeem them by paying the redemption price and set them free from the auction block. And so in the ransom theory, Jesus comes as a substitute and ransoms us. He pays the price to set us free from our slavery and our bondage and delivers us from Satan and the consequences and curse of sin and ultimately of death. Another theory that people had was that of called the Christus Victor theory. And that was really one of the more dominant ones that what Jesus came to do when he lived his life and died the death as well as his resurrection, was in order to defeat as a king, as a victor in battle, to defeat sin, to defeat death, and to defeat the devil in order to deliver and set mankind free from its bondage. It's a little different than the ransom theory because in the ransom theory, some seeing Jesus basically paying God off, or maybe even the devil, some would say, to set men free, but that's 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 not any in any no biblical truth associated with that. But Jesus does come in the ransom theory as a substitute in order to defeat sin, Satan, and death and liberate us. Now there were there was a beautiful picture of this because it was probably the more predominant theory with the early believers 
that when C.S. Lewis wrote, and I've used this before, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe in the Chronicles of Narnia, he kind of takes this theory and he incorporates it into the story of Aslan and those children. They find themselves in this beautiful fantasy world of Narnia, and in this fantasy world there is an evil witch, a powerful sorceress. She has seized control of Narnia. One of the four children that goes in is a whiny little brat named Edmund. And Edmund ends up conspiring with this evil queen, Jadis. He yields to her temptation against his three siblings, who they are on the run, and while they are on the run, they eventually encounter Aslan, the magnificent lion and king, and the rightful ruler of Narnia. Well, Aslan, he plans to rescue Edmund. He intends to save and deliver him. But when he confronts the evil queen about it, she reminds him of the magic which the emperor put into Narnia at the very beginning. There was a moral order to Narnia. And therefore, the queen stipulates this one thing. She said, quote, Every traitor belongs to me as my lawful prey, and that for every treachery I have a right to a kill. That human creature is mine. His life is forfeit to me. His blood is my property. The moral order, or the deep magic, as C.S. Lewis calls it, cannot simply just be forgotten or waved away because that's the way it was set by the original emperor. Despite Edmund's sins, Aslan is not angry. He's not upset or full of wrath. He loves little Edmund. So he offers himself up as a sacrifice in Edmund's place. Now, the great lion is a great great, greater prize to the wicked queen than any human creature. And so she is sure that since she could kill Aslan, that would finally allow her then to take control over all of Narnia, and it would be her. So she delightfully accepts the offer. Aslan is taken. He is strapped down to this huge stone table. Her evil, ugly minions shear his mane. They torment him. They torture him. And eventually she takes the knife and drives it through his heart and kills him. The stone table is where the great magic of Narnia is carried out. But when everyone thinks all is lost, Aslan is resurrected. Like the temple veil the stone table is split in two. And in the 15th chapter of that first book, Aslan explains this, quote, Though the witch knew the deep magic, there is a magic deeper still which she did not know. Her knowledge goes back only to the dawn of time. But if she could have looked a little farther back, Into the stillness and the darkness before time dawned, she would have read there a different incantation. She would have known that when a willing victim who had committed no treachery was killed in a traitor's stead, the table would crack and death itself would start working backwards. Self-sacrificial love in this story is stronger than any law or any magic. It's the therefore the one thing that could set a treacherous covenant breaker free. So on the cross, was it a ransom? Was it a moral example? There was another theory that came along a little later called the satisfaction theory that Anselm developed that said, well, the wages of sin is death. Somebody's got to pay that wage. Somebody has got to satisfy justice. 
Because the law demands justice. And so Jesus was the one that stepped in and took the justice of the law upon himself, the curse of the law, so that we would not have to in order to pay back the injustice of human sin and satisfy the justice of God. And then not long after that, along came about the time of the Reformation in the 1500s, another theory was developed building upon that satisfaction theory that is really a perversion. It's twisted. And we've talked about this before. What's known as penal substitutionary atonement. That basically says that, you know, Jesus, it's a moral thing. It's a legal thing. It's all legal and it's got to be, God's got to be satisfied. And so basically God takes his son because God is so angry at humanity because of its sin. God then takes his son and makes his son the whipping post. And that God in, in his fury throws out all of his anger, all of his wrath on his son that he punishes him and vents all of his anger on his son. Jesus willingly takes it because Jesus, you see, has got to change God the Father's mind about humanity. God's mad at humanity. So Jesus has got to persuade him not to be mad. And the only way to do that is for Jesus to take his wrath. And so you've got a cosmic abuser dealing with his only son in an abusive way so he can have a change of heart and attitude toward humanity. And when you begin to take that out into its all the ramifications of it, in that theory, yes, God does turn his back on his son. God doesn't look on his son. But you see, there are very, not only ethical problems with that way of thinking, there are some literal problems in the whole of the makeup of the Trinity. You have God separating Himself from Himself, which is impossible. You have the Father and the Son at cross purposes, which is impossible. Again, it paints a very vile view of God, of an angry tyrant who the only way he could be persuaded to love you or me was through which what Jesus would do. Theology professor Glenn Kreider says that the unity of the Trinity is a good enough reason to reject this doctrine of divine abuse. God could hardly forsake himself without going against his own word and destroying the harmony and unity in the Godhead. The doctrine of the Trinity is the most compelling reason to reject this teaching that on the cross the Father rejected his Son. Another theologian, Thomas McCall, said there's no biblical evidence that the father-son communion was somehow ruptured on that day. Nowhere is it written that the father was angry with the son. Nowhere can we read that God curses him to the pit of hell. Nowhere is it written that Jesus absorbs the wrath of God by taking the exact punishment we deserved. In no passage is there any indication that God's wrath is infinitely intense as it is poured out on Jesus. So people step back and say, which one is right? Which theory is right? Well, you ask the question, why did Jesus have to die? Here's what the apostles would simply answer you. The reason why Jesus had to die, the ultimate answer is love. For God so loved. This is why he went to the cross. This is what the law and the prophets were pointing to. All these different theories are trying to do is describe the mechanism of what was behind the cross, what was really transpiring and taking place. And believe me, folks, Christians have split over this stuff. Churches have split over it. In fact, even today, there's a vast majority of people in the reform camp who hold to a penal substitutionary theory. And if you hold to a different theory than that, they call you a heretic. We have split over these things, and again, you know, it's kind of like arguing over what keeps a human being alive. Someone would say, well, it's oxygen. Somebody else would say, no, 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 it's food. Somebody else would say, no, you got to have water. Someone else might simply say, well, it's the sun. You know, the sun shining down. Without the sun, there would be no life. Which one is right? They're all right. There's an aspect of each of those that is correct. 
The cross and the work of Jesus is like a mosaic. Different things coming together. As one writer said, the riches of Christ's work are inexhaustible. And our little models, they are but paltry efforts to proclaim how wide, long, high, and deep is God's love. Christ's work is always greater than the human attempts to describe it, and theologians must not make graven images of our portraits of atonement. Particular pieces of atonement theology, they do fit together, not as a puzzle, but as a mosaic icon meant to guide our worship. What happened at the cross? Did he set an example for us? Yes, he did. He did. Did he ransom and redeem us? Yes, he did. Did he satisfy the just demands of God's law? Yes, he did. Was he punished by his father and his father turned him back on his back on his son? No, no. That is one piece of the mosaic that needs to go in the trash bin of infinity. There's a portion of all of those things that paint a beautiful picture of what Christ did for us. What about the resurrection? Did the law and the prophets speak about the resurrection? Well, what's interesting is our famous passage for the resurrection is in 1 Corinthians 15. We always quote that generally at funerals. We jump to that passage and talk about future resurrection. Well, in 1 Corinthians 15, the verse First portions of that chapter in verses 3 and 4, Paul says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that the Messiah died for our sins according to the Scriptures. What Scriptures is he talking about? The law, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. He died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Not only did the Scriptures say he would die and how he would die, they also said he would be raised, and he would be raised on the third day. One of the more famous ones that are quoted in the New Testament, Psalm 16, 10, the writer says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. It would be a brief stay in the grave. Because the Jews believed that after the third day, then corruption would start to set in. But up to that point, it hadn't started yet. Decay had not started. Even more so, Hosea chapter 6, 1 and 2 says, Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but He will heal us. He has injured us, but He will bind up our wounds. After two days, He will revive us. And on the third day, He will restore us that we may live in his presence. Now, the prophecy was given to Israel as a whole, but the sequence of events would be full restoration on the third day. You even have it in Genesis. Remember Abraham taking Isaac up to offer him up on Mount Moriah? Hebrews 11, verse 19 says that Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. And do you know which day was they came down from Moriah? The third day. The third day. Jesus even said, I'll tell you guys a sign. It's the sign of Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the whale or the fish, the great fish, for three days, three nights. Even so will the Son of Man go into the heart of the earth. He told him that. Three days. Again, all these little stories back here we read in the Old Testament, there are moral lessons in them, there are principles we can learn from them, but the majority of them, they're saying, hey, hey, we've got a bigger picture here. We're pointing you to somebody. And something that's going to happen in the future that's the greatest thing that will ever happen to humanity. It's about the Messiah. His resurrection. What about his ascension? We always tend to forget about that. It is a big deal, folks. Him ascending through the heavens. Not only in the atmosphere above the earth, but he went through the spiritual heavens. He went through the domain of Satan. 
the prince of the power of the air, triumphantly. They could not stop him in his ascent to the throne. Psalm 24, verses 7 and 8 prophesied this, Lift up your heads, O gates, and be open up, you everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Paul quotes Psalm 68, verses 17 and 18 concerning the ascension of Jesus. The chariots of God are myriads, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them as at Sinai in holiness. You have ascended on high. You've led captive your captives. You've received gifts among men, even among the rebellious also, that the Lord God may dwell there. Psalm 110, verse 1, which we talked about, God's favorite passage of Scripture quoted in the New Testament. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And the psalm that Jesus sang on His way to the Garden of Gethsemane on the night of the Passover, which all of those psalms, Psalm 113, 114, 115, 116, 117, 118, these were the psalms they sang after the meal. And in Psalm 118, verse 19, Open to me the gates of righteousness, and I shall enter through them. I will give thanks to the Lord. His resurrection, His ascension, and His coming again. Psalm 50, verses 3 through 6 the writer says, may our God come and not keep silence. Fire devours before Him. It's very tempestuous around Him. He summons the heavens above the earth to judge His people. Gather my godly ones to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice in the heavens, declare His righteousness, for God Himself is judge. Selah. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will rest upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end to order it and establish it with justice and with righteousness from henceforth, even forevermore, for the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Isaiah 66, 18, For I know their works and their thoughts, the time is coming to gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and they will see my glory. Daniel 7, 13 and 14, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days, was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion's an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Zechariah saw a time. Zechariah 12, verse 10, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. That's a future thing. Jesus said, you won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There's coming a time when Jesus makes a physical appearance and He reveals Himself as He comes and the Jewish people there in Israel, they will look upon Him, it says, whom they have pierced and they will see and believe. Zechariah 14, 4 through 8 says, In that day, His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives which is in the front of Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a large valley so that half of the mountain will move to the north and the other half toward the south. What's interesting is you know there is an earthquake fault line that runs right through the middle of that mountain. And then when Jesus sets foot on that mountain at His return, it will split. You will flee by the way of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel. Yes, you will flee as you fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all his holy ones with him. And in that day there will be no light. The luminaries will dwindle, for it will be such a unique day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but it will come about that at evening time there will be light. And in that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and the other half toward the western sea. It will be summer as well as winter. All of that hearkens to what John saw in Revelation. Rivers of life flowing out from beneath the throne of God. When Jesus said, 
Ought not the Messiah to have suffered? All of these things which Moses and the prophets and the writings pointed to. I cannot imagine what it was like for those men on the Emmaus Road walking with him and him taking these scriptures and opening it up for them. All their, their minds were being blown and they could not describe it but in any way, but after he made the blessing at the table with them and disappeared, and they said, did not our hearts burn within us while he walked with us on the way and explained the scriptures to us? Our hearts were on fire. This is what needs to happen when you and I read the Scripture. When we read Torah, when we read the prophets, when we read the Psalms, we're not just trying to get a cute little verse for the day to get us through. That's all well and good. We're trying to discover Him. We are diving in to find Him and see where is He revealed here. What is the Father showing me about Himself? What is He showing me about His Son? What is it pointing to about him? God, show me Jesus. Show me the glory that's here when I read these passages of Scripture. And when the Holy Spirit comes and he starts teaching and showing you, when you, you, you don't want to put this down, your heart starts to burn within you. A fire is ignited inside of you, not because you're getting knowledge, but because you're falling in love with him. It is a, it's a fire of passion. It's a fire of devotion. It's a fire of a hunger and thirst and commitment to walk with this person and to be changed into his likeness. To be like him. To know. That's why Paul, when Paul got his mind blown out there in the desert for those three and a half years at Mount Sinai, all of those scriptures opening up to him, the whole plan unfolding before him, this is why he would later write to the Philippians. He said, look, I count everything as dung manure compared with the excellency of knowing him. And then he said, I want to know him. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to be conformed to the image of his death. Follow his example. I want to do that. Because before me is a finish line, and when I cross that finish line, I want to cross that finish line well. I want to cross it running full bore across it into the arms of my Savior, my King, God's chosen man who came and established this new covenant that far supersedes the first one in glory. And as a result of us believing, something radical has happened to us now. And we'll find out what that is, Lord willing, next week. Father, thank you for your son. Thank you that you've given us a sure word of prophecy, as Peter said. We're not poking around in the dark guessing. You clearly stated what you would do, how you would do it, why you would do it, when you would do it, where you would do it, how it would all unfold, and what the end result would be. And we can do nothing but stand before you this morning and say, thank you. Thank you. Help us to be changed and transformed. Ignite our hearts. Let them burn within us. As we see Jesus, in his name we ask.